Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to discuss creation spirituality. My guest is Matthew Fox, whom I last interviewed over 30 years ago. Matthew is a spiritual theologian, originally a Dominican Catholic priest who was silenced by the Vatican for his theological work. He eventually became an Episcopal priest and an activist for gender justice and eco-justice. He has written 37 books that have been translated into other languages over 70 times. Among them are Original Blessing, The Coming of the Cosmic Christ, A Spirituality Named Compassion, The Reinvention of Work, the Hidden Spirituality of Men, Christian Mystics, and The Pope's War. His most recent book is Matthew Fox, Essential Writings on Creation Spirituality. He has contributed much to the rediscovery of Hildegard of Bingen, Meister Eckhart, and Thomas Aquinas as pre-modern mystics and prophets. Matthew holds a doctorate in the history and theology of spirituality from the Institut Catholique de Paris, the, and he is the founder of the University of Creation Spirituality in California. Matthew is based in Northern California, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Matthew. It's a pleasure to be with you again after, I think, about three decades since our last interview. It has been a while, Jeff, and I'm glad to be reconnecting. The, the last time I interviewed you, you were uh, still a Catholic priest, a Dominican priest, and now you've uh, joined the Episcopal Church and consider yourself an interdenominational priest. Yes, there was some history back then, and um, now is now. In a way, that history is a, a definitive moment for creation spirituality because it, it clearly contrasted the work you're doing with the orthodox approach that the Vatican took at that time. That's true, but um, I actually would not call the previous Vatican uh, that is under Pope John Paul II and and Benedict XVI, um, Orthodox, frankly. I would call it hyper-conservative. Uh, the backing they gave Opus Dei, for example, which was a is a fascist institution, and their dismembering of liberation theology in South America and so forth. These were not um, high points in, in Christian history by any means. So... Um, I think that tradition I've been recovering, including original blessing, is uh, far more orthodox in the sense of authentic to the to the tradition than um, what they were pushing. Um, just one example would be Genesis one, the very first page of our Bible, uh, talks about the goodness of creation throughout. It's a whole cosmology, and and at the end when humans come, it doesn't talk about sin and evil. It says everything now is very good and very beautiful. The Hebrew word there can be translated beautiful. So that's the very first page of our Bible. And I don't know who tore it out of <laughs> all these preachers' um, Bibles over the centuries. So I'm just bringing that back. So I propose that what I'm talking about is much more Jewish, much more biblical. And Jesus, as we know, never heard of original sin. No Jew has. So um, I think. In many ways, the church has wandered off the um, the uh, Christ path in many um, circumstances over the centuries, and I, it's just part of my job to uh, try to get get it back. And not just me; all the other scholars and um, and thinkers, uh, I think, are headed in the direction I've been heading. But you are right; it is a milestone, I guess, my being 
evicted <laughs> uh, for many, both inside and outside uh, the church. But that's how history rolls. <laughs> You know, Matthew, uh, one of the things that we have in common is that we're both from Wisconsin, and I can still hear a, a, a trace of the Wisconsin accent uh, in you, and I know you're born in Madison, or grew up in Madison, which is where I did my undergraduate work. It was really a radical school. I, I was there in the 1960s, and uh, it was a, an era of incredible social ferment, and uh, I I think you came of age at the same time and in the Midwest. Uh, there's something, I think, essentially Midwestern about your approach. And in, in a way, it's although I haven't followed a, a path like yours, uh, I, I think there are many similarities. And, and I consider it very mainstream Midwestern American in a way. <laughs> well, um, you're right. I, I had forgotten that we had that in common, that we both grew up in Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin and Madison, too. So, um, yeah, I think Wisconsin and the Midwest in general has these basic values about work and about um, the land, you know, that we're, you know, that we're, I mean, Wisconsin is very much an agricultural state or used to be. And, and of course, the four seasons, you and I lived in a time before climate change really burst open and we had four very definite seasons as i recall i remember one winter there was so much snow we had to go out the the second floor window because the snow had climbed over our front door and as kids we thought that was really thrilling and wonderful and uh yeah so growing up close to the earth and the lakes and the and the Four Seasons, and and the memory of the indigenous people there. I had a lot of Native American dreams when I was young, and now I understand why that the spirit is still alive um, on a, on Wisconsin soil, if you will. And I've been very blessed over the years with Native American teachers and so forth. But I think that interest and that opening in my own heart began in Wisconsin, growing up in Wisconsin. Fundamental truths about goodness, for example, were ingrained in, in people in those days. And while, uh, while there were political extremists, I had the sense that most people, conservatives or liberals in, in that era, strove to get along with each other. Well, I think so. And I think we all believed in democracy. And somehow that's been broken uh, in the last... Uh, this recent era of politics, uh, when people, some people are saying that what happened on January 6th was normal political discourse. That's, that, that was not my Wisconsin experience, and nor my other experience after that, either in America or in France or other places, I believe. So, uh, yeah, but what you're saying is important, I think, that I know I, I do owe a lot to my experiences in Wisconsin. I went to public high school in Madison, and I so I encountered people of other traditions. So my closest friends were Jewish or agnostic or Protestant. And we'd have these great debates with each other, philosophical debates. And so I'd go back to my parish priest who fed me books by Aquinas and G.K. Chesterton and so forth. And, and that awakened my intellectual uh, interest in in my faith tradition, and that stayed with me since. And I think also just the presence of the university um, was part of that too. You know, the idea that an intellectual life is is part of, um, what should I say, part of being an adult. And uh, so, yeah, I learned a lot of valuable lessons in Wisconsin, and, and my parents were, were wonderfully, um, what should I say, open-minded and encouraging of our um, trips to museums and all that. I mean, my mother once said, it was raining out, we were all kind of hanging indoors. She said, get out of the house, get out of the house. She said, I don't want, I don't want to raise children who are boring. She said, go to the museum, go to the museum, go do this, go do that. So uh, she was good at that, <laughs> uh, urging us to find, find um, information and uh, curio feed our curiosity and go for it. And, and Madison had so much to offer, as you know. 
Well, I am under the impression that uh, some of the original foundational ideas for creation spirituality were taught to you while you were in a, uh, I think it would have been a Dominican seminary, if I recall correctly, in Iowa. Hmm. Well, um, my Dominican journey began in Iowa at uh, uh, Loris College in my undergraduate years, then Winona, Minnesota for a novitiate class, and then River Forest, Illinois for three years of philosophy. And then um, back to Iowa uh, for my three years of, of theology. So yeah, it was definitely a circle of, <laughs> of Midwestern places, Iowa, Minnesota, um, and uh, Illinois, and back to Iowa. So yeah, that too kind of, um, I say, grounded, grounded my my view of the world. And also, when I was in Dubuque, I took some courses at Iowa State University, which had um, some interesting. I remember I took a course from a Russian Orthodox theologian, and that was very interesting to me to be exposed to that tradition uh, in my youth. In my youth, and. Um, yeah, then I went from Dubuque to Paris, which was a big of a jump, a bit of a jump, and uh, met my mentor there, Pierre Chenu, the French Dominican, who named the creation spiritual tradition for me. But it answered the questions I had uh, from my Dominican training about the relationship of mysticism to politics and about the relationship to our bodies, and um, because there was kind of a mixed message you were getting uh, from the Catholic Church about. Um, our relationship to our bodies, and I felt that that Christ spirituality really answers that in a non-dualistic way, and um, that's why Aquinas got in so much trouble bringing Aristotle into theology in the Middle Ages, because uh, Plato was ruling the roost for a thousand years in Christian theology, and he was very dualistic about women and about the body, and about matter in general, whereas Aristotle was much more trying to bring matter and spirit, soul and body together. And that's what Aquinas did, too. And he got in a lot of trouble for doing it. They condemned him three times after he died. Um, so that was my tradition. And I'm grateful to the Dominicans for that. One of the core ideas that you were introduced to in Paris, now I understand, uh, is, is the notion of the distinction between the theology based on the fall of man and the redemption of man after the fall, as opposed to creation spirituality. Yes, um, right. Creation spirituality begins with creation, not with the human. And of course, this is where indigenous people begin. And it's where your pre-modern thinkers begin, like Aquinas and Hildegard of Bingen and, and Meister Eckhart. They begin with the universe. And of course, today that is so important because we're getting a new story of the universe from science. And um, this puts everything else in perspective. And when you begin with a human, um, well, Pope Francis calls it narcissism, that we have a, a species narcissism problem. And that is what brought about the the trouble of climate change, you know, our divorce from Nate, the rest of nature and the idea that that humans, the earth is here to serve humans exclusively. Um, and this has dominated Western consciousness for 500 years. A lot of the reason comes from the 15th century, well, the 14th century, when the um, bubonic plague hit um, Europe so strong, and one out of two or one out of three people died from it. And, you know, we had, we're had we having this pandemic now, but imagine what it was like before science, before promise of vaccines, and people were dropping dead all around you, and very suddenly you died within three or four days, and it was an ugly death. Your whole body was filled with pus and everything. It was like AIDS on steroids or something. And a lot of people freaked out. And Thomas Berry, the great geologian, says that this was a time when religion in the West shifted from being um, open, like think of St. Francis, to the experience of God in nature, to being afraid of nature and afraid of death. And so redemption took over and kind of pushed creation aside. And this is very clear in the Protestant Reformation, which came 150 years later. And, and, and the Catholic response to it, none of them talked about creation. They were all talking about how you get to heaven versus hell 
and and is all about redemption from sins and not about, well, Aquinas says the essence of true religion is this, supreme gratitude and thankfulness. That, he says, is the essence of religion. Well, after the 14th century, that was out the window. The essence of religion was, how do I get saved? How do I get saved? How do I avoid hell? And and what do I do with all my sins? And so we just shifted the whole game. And and it's not Jewish. It's not biblical. In the Jewish tradition, you don't even ask, am I saved? You ask, are we? Are we, you know, saving one another? Are we helping one another, healing one another? Are we liberating one another? And um uh, so there is a real shift. And what I love about Julian, and my most recent book was on Julian Norwich, is that she's real clear, even though everyone else is freaking out. She talks about, she says, God is the goodness in nature, the goodness in nature. And she even says, God is nature. And and she goes on and on. She's utterly non-dualist. She says, God is in our sensuality. Well, you can't get more unplatonic than that. And... um and uh, she's true to her womanhood, too. So it's just amazing. She comes in at the end of this wonderful lineage of Hildegard of Bingen, Francis of Sissi Aquinas, Meister Eckhart. She kind of at the end of that. And during this very difficult time of pandemic, she was seven when the pandemic first hit England. And then it kept coming back in waves her entire life. She lived into her 80s. So there are so many of these wonderful mystics who who think the way I think we all should be thinking today about the sacredness of creation and about gratitude for it. And therefore, is this being reflected in the choices we make, whether economic or political or educational, how we raise our children, etc. So that's the creative spirituality. And the, it's uh, it's not beginning with the bad news of original sin. It's beginning with the good news of 13.8 billion years that have been blessings because they brought us and this amazing planet and all these amazing beings we share it with uh, have brought us here. So why wouldn't we be excited and awestruck and grateful and even reverent for that? So that's the shift that that I think we need. And um, I'm so I'm so pleased that I've been able to be an instrument in trying to bring forward that lineage that's been buried and beaten up and accused of heresy. I mean, Aquinas was condemned, then they canonized him a saint. Eckhart was condemned, they haven't canonized him a saint. Julian was ignored. Julian was the first woman to write a book in English, and it wasn't published for 300 years. It's, it's a long time to wait for your first book review. And even when it did come out, they ignored her. And um, Hildegard of Bingen has been ignored for hundreds of years. Now, <clears throat> I started writing about her 25 years ago or so, but um, now they've canonized her saint and made her a doctor of the church, which is great. But one asks, why was she ignored for 800 years uh, in mainstream Christianity? Well, because she was talking about these things and about she was presenting a feminist view of the world, a woman's view of the world, and of divinity, too. Like Julian talks about God as mother and develops it very thoroughly. And, of course, that didn't happen again until the late 20th century. So Julian was 700 years ahead of, ahead of the church. So uh, anyway, there's a lot of dimensions that are, are um, important today for our very survival that the creation spiritual tradition has, uh, has, has always preached, but very often not found a, an audience, especially not at the um, decision-making levels of <laughs> of education and of, uh, of religion. Human culture across the planet, with some exceptions, has been largely patriarchal, whether you're talking about indigenous people or Asian cultures or Western cultures, uh, particularly the uh, three major monotheistic religions are, are based on this sense of, of patriarchy and, and the idea of a, a sky god, essentially, a masculine god in, in the sky, whereas the Feminine traditions seem to emphasize the body and and the earth more. Well, that's that's true. Except I would disagree about the indigenous. Um, one scholar of indigenous religions defines it this way: Aboriginal mother love, Aboriginal mother love. 
So the indigenous, of course, have stayed in touch with Mother Earth. Yeah, Pachamama is one such title given from South American indigenous people. But but they've they've tried to bring together, you know, not always successfully, Father Sky and Mother Earth. So even when you you pray and dance with the indigenous people, of course, your your knees are bent, so you're connecting to Mother Earth and your first chakra, by the way. But also you you lightly roll your shoulders to bring in the energy of Father Sky. So even their their ceremonies, their practices, and of course, a sweat lodge is very, very maternal. It's returning to the womb, really, in the dark, as we were for nine months. And um, uh, that too, I mean, so many of their practices are also true to a healthy balance of the masculine and the feminine. And of course, the, the Seneca and Iroquois people, you know, they their, their last... Um, their Supreme Court <laughs> uh, was a council of grandmothers, a circle of grandmothers. So, um, and in many ways, they developed an authentic democracy in their governmental practices. So I think a lot of these traditions have been far truer to the uh, feminine awareness than, uh, as you say, the, um, the dominant um, biblical traditions have been. And... But I, I do think, you know, along the line, you, um, <clears throat> of course, Jesus represented, I think, a new um, influx of the feminine consciousness when he insisted on compassion. And of course, compassion in Hebrew and in Arabic, it comes from the word for womb. So it, it is bringing back motherhood that we're all capable of, women and men alike. And, um, and of course, many of his followers were women and um so he he definitely represented a more balanced, I think, uh, consciousness and uh, and the wisdom tradition of Israel from which he derives is um, is feminine and wisdom. Hakma Hakma in Hebrew is feminine, as is Sophia in Greek, which means wisdom. And so um, he, and he, he's always calling people to wisdom because wisdom includes the heart and wisdom includes the whole, the cosmos. And. Uh, and of course, that's present in the East too, with Tara and um, and Kuan Yin, who's sitting over my right shoulder. I'm not sure if you can see her, but um, <clears throat> so you, know, you, you have to kind of hunt, though, like you say, because the men, you know, get to the top and <laughs> make the rules, and uh, so it's kind of hard to find. But you kind of dig for these. That's what a lot of my life has been digging for these mystics who had a, a consciousness of the masculine and the feminine. And um, they're not all just women. Like Eckhart says, what does God do all day long? God lies in a maternity bed giving birth. So that's a pretty explicit statement of the divine motherhood, too. So, uh, yeah, I think so. Part of our work is to is to listen uh, ever more deeply to these um, these carriers of wisdom that we call mystics. Dorothy Sola is a wonderful theologian of our time she's deceased now but she used to say that um the mysticism represents the opposite of patriarchy that that it's a whole language for thinking more in terms of interconnectivity even with divinity like the circle the web of life and so forth and of course hildegard talks about that all the time and so it deconstructs the latter thinking of uh, you know that some people are over other people and and um and that's God's intention. <laughs> uh, she says that no, that the mysticism is about love, and love is is a horizontal experience, is not necessarily a vertical experience. I sometimes say to myself uh, when I look at uh, the, the world's mystical traditions and, and particularly the data of parapsychology, which is my specialty, I, I say to myself, love everyone and everything all of the time, and uh, which is a non-dual philosophy, but it seems to be very different than the idea that you must love God and hate the devil. <laughs> Okay, so so you want to promote uh, a new commandment, love the devil? <laughs> uh, you know, in a way I do, because if, if you're thinking in terms of creation, spirituality, uh, whatever the devil is, is uh, got to be part of creation. Why not? <laughs> Why not?
<laughs> well, I think there's both the yes to life, which is the love, but there's also the no, you know, and that's and the yes is the mystical contribution, especially, I think. And uh, William James talks about that in his book on Brighter's religious experience, that, that mysticism is a yes faculty, he says. But but no is a prophetic side of our our spiritual journey. And we do have to say no to injustice. We have to say no to racism. We have to say no to sexism that like we're talking about. We have to say no to um, what I call matricide, the killing of Mother Earth that's going on. And we have to say no to denial. You know, that we we have to say no to to falsehood um, as much as we can. I mean, no one knows everything or is uh, is feel lonely with truth. So we have to listen to one another and argue and debate and all those things. But um, but I think there is this dialectic of yes and no of the mystic and the prophet in all of us. Um, uh, Rabbi Heschel defines a prophet's primary work as interfering. So you have to interfere with injustice. I mean, I think this is what's going on in Ukraine now that they they refuse to say yes to having their sovereign state invaded and and essentially disappeared uh, from the map. So uh, I think there really are some serious uh, issues in which we have to make choices. So I think uh, at the level of being, as Eckhart says, there's an equality of being, but at the level of action, that humans are responsible for the choices we make. And that's what morality is. Uh, that um, all choices are not equal. <laughs> and I think the choice to invade another country versus the choice to resist an invasion are not equal in the, in the, um, uh, the, the, the line that we call morality. Um, and of course, this is where a lot of courage is coming out, and we're seeing it uh, almost daily, uh, that a lot of people are, are risking their life like the president of the Ukraine is for other people, so it's um, it's an act of of sacrifice and of love, um, and um, and I think we all grow up in that context of courage and compassion and justice, and we can look back to what Dr. King did and what Gandhi did and what Mandela did, and, and you know these great people who were capable of forgiveness and of converting uh, hostility to to love. And um, and to justice. So these are the kind of people we honor, and um, and many more. And I think these are the kind of people we want to emulate. And that there is a difference between uh, the sacred and evil. Um, both are forces, but um, I think we have to build discernment so that we can um, recognize as best as we can, because no one has all the answers, but as best as we can, uh, what what flow and what direction is um, is sustainable uh, for our species. And, you know, one thing I've been meditating on now is that they're, they're discovering in Southeast Asia all kinds of our, our relatives, our cousins, uh, who were also hominids like we are. You know, we know about Neanderthal in Europe, and we know about the denizens in Siberia, but now they're finding 14 others they've named now, and they keep finding more. But what's so interesting to me about these 14 or 16 cousins of ours is that they're all out of business. We're the last one standing, Homo sapiens. And at the rate we're going, we're going out of business, truly. What climate change can do to us and other species in terms of extinction is, is staring us in the face. Science says we have seven years left to change our ways. And um, so, and then of course the war like in Ukraine and the threats of nuclear war that, are, that are, are coming out. I mean, any one of those paths. And then of course the melting down of democracy. Um, I think any one of these three paths can do us in as a species. And um, so we're living in this very special time in planet's history and human history. And um, that's why I think we need the, the wisdom of the mystics and the wisdom of the mystic in all of us, the lover, what you're talking about, the love. And, um, but also the, the spiritual warrior 
who will stand up and be counted when, um, you know, when an extinction uh, is knocking on our door, which it literally is. I, I think that was very elegantly put. I think that uh, I'm actually in total agreement with all of those sentiments. And uh, yet at the same time, I'm aware that what you're expressing is a viewpoint that these days is conventionally equated with uh, political liberalism. And I think it's probably fair to say that the creation spirituality movement is identified with political liberalism. Would you agree with that? Well, I think it's something much bigger than politics. You know, we talk about the human soul. We're talking about our relationship to divinity. So, no, I wouldn't say that. I think um, you can be a healthy conservative and um, still have a worldview that does not put the human as number one, but and doesn't put, therefore, corporations as number one or Wall Street as number one. Um, it's very easy to fall into idolatry. We don't hear much about idolatry these days, but I think it's actually the headlines in most of our of our news. Um, that uh, no, I, I, w I would not stuff Greece spirituality into any political basket. Um, I think it's it's more foundational than that. Spirit spirit does not uh, attach itself to any one ideology. Now that, you know, that politics that raise questions about justice and injustice, um, I think that's real important. And I think anything less than that is, is idolatry. And, and it's very easy for humans to make idols of Wall Street or idols of comfort or idols of um, my tribe is better than your tribe or my race is, is superior to your race. All these tribalisms. Are um, you know are embedded in our history and, and we're still wrestling with them obviously, but um, justice uh, and compassion I think they cut through um, uh, labels and um, and ideologies and if they don't they're not deep enough. <laughs> uh, to me, the spirit is well, like Eckhart says that God's ground and my ground are the same. So we talk about ground here, and I don't think that a label of Democrat or Republican necessarily represents a ground. If if both are working in their best way for justice and healing and compassion, um, um, and that means taking on racism and sexism and adultism and and the rest, then then they're tapping into these roots into the ground. But very often politics is walking around at a superficial level, you know, like uh, Eckhart says, God is a great underground river that no one can dam up and no one can destroy. The whole idea of many wells into that river. And I talk about the in terms of religion, there's a Jewish well and a Buddhist well and a Muslim well and a, a Christian well and so forth. But we all go down some well. But the point is to get to the, that underground river, which is one. It's not uh, the wells. We shouldn't confuse the well with the river. And I think that's you could even apply that to politics, too. That there are different wells, but are we um, are we diving down uh, deeply enough to find solutions to the real problems that that, you know, that our species has created and that we face today? Uh, that would be my, and that to me is what spirituality is, is it's, it's diving into that well. It's a great line from John of the Cross, the great mystic of the 16th century, who was also a very prophetic because he took on the Inquisition and he took on the corruption in his own uh, Carmelite order at the time, corruption in, in the church in Spain. But it is a wonderful line. He says, launch out into the deep, launch out into the deep. I love that invitation. He's saying, don't stay on the shore. You know, that life is too precious and too important to stay on the shore the whole time. you got to launch out into the deep. And, of course, that word deep is a wonderful archetype, isn't it, for the unconscious, for uh, the depths of life, that, that groundedness that Eckhart talks about, the ground. Uh, that, to me, is what spirituality is. It's not staying at the surface of life. It's trying to live a deep 
a deep life. And, um, and, and, and at the same time, resisting those who want to just put it in some little box, a silo, and put it over here and get it, get it out of their hair. I mean, like, they tried to get Jesus out of their hair, you know, that's what the crucifixion was about. The Roman Empire, this guy's too much. He's talking about another kingdom. We don't want that. And it's here. He's not about a kingdom after death. He's talking about a kingdom. He says it's here. You know, that was a bit much for the empire to take, and especially since the the emperor at the time was called Filius Dei, the son of God. That's how they that's how they labeled um, Augustus. And uh, of course, the Christians picked up on that and said, "Well, you got your son of God. We got this one." And uh, so anyway. Yeah, we have to be careful of being swallowed up by those with the power to to um, generate uh, political discourse, um, and especially when <laughs> the political discourse in our lifetime, you're in my lifetime, has turned so sour. You know, I, I think of the hate radio of Rush Limbaugh, and now we have hate television, and and now we have no wonder we have hate politics, you know, it's been going on for decades and as if it didn't matter. I had a friend once who drove across the country. I don't remember when he told me, it's maybe 15 years ago. And he said um, every place he went, you could get Rush Limbaugh on the radio. But there are many places where you couldn't get NPR on the radio. <laughs> So that shows what money can do. You know, it gets you everywhere and and hate sells and it riles up the, you know, the worst instincts. But we all have them of hatred and, and anger, violence in people. And I think our whole our whole politics today has descended to that level. And now we don't just have radio we have TV and we've got Twitter and all the other inventions. So we keep inventing things for humans. We're real good at that. But we don't pause and say, what are the shadow side to this invention? You know, do we really want everyone uh, twittering uh, daily their their angst and their projections, <laughs> their fears? I, how does that poison our own souls and those of our children and so forth? You know, we have to ask about that. Um, and I, I don't think we're in a very good place in that regard at this time in history. There is a religious movement that I sometimes think of as overlapping with creation spirituality in some senses. I'm talking about uh, what are sometimes called the traditionalist movement in religion, which, as I understand it, uh, recognizes the perennial philosophy that there are core truths that cut across all religions. And, and yet, at the same time, I get the impression that these people uh, are, are not as open to the depths as, as you are. They seem to feel that uh, there's something evil or satanic about the depths, and, and they're very uh, wary of, uh, of these new movements and this multicultural openness that you exhibit. Yes, that's, that's true, um, that fear kind of dominates, and really it comes down to a tribalism very often that we're right and everyone else is wrong. But that's, you know, you look at the the diversity in creation and then the diversity on this planet. And um, there's a wonderful sentence from Thomas Aquinas, who's a declared saint and doctor of the church, 13th century. And he said, um, truth, whoever utters it, always comes from the Holy Spirit. That all truth is from the Holy Spirit. So if the indigenous people have found truth in their practices and in their beliefs, that comes from the Holy Spirit. And if Buddhists have done so, that comes from the Holy Spirit, etc. So the Holy Spirit is not labeled Catholic or Jewish or Protestant or atheist. And therefore, we should be open to everybody and invite their wisdom to the table. I think that's one of the great signs of hope of our time that we talked about the women's movement, if you will, the return of the divine feminine, but also the fact that for the first time in, real, in human history, really, we have a banquet of all the world's spiritual um, traditions, and uh, there's ways to learn to meditate from all of them. And so where the meditation for me is calming that reptilian brain. And if we don't calm, calm the reptilian brain, we are doomed as a species. 
the reptilian brain has been dominating for long enough. And um, that's what's going on in Ukraine. I mean, nothing more reptilian than seeing these images every night of the destruction of apartments and condos and children and women and, and old men and all the rest. Um, that's the unleashing of the reptilian brain. We have to learn to tame that so that the mammal brain, which is our brain of compassion, as we alluded to earlier, and um, the motherhood of both women and men, that this can flourish. And this is not only what Jesus taught, the importance of compassion, Luke 6, be you compassionate, create us compassion, but the Buddha taught it, the Dalai Lama teaches it. He says, we can do away with all religion, but we can't do away with compassion. Compassion is my religion. Well, that's what Jesus was saying too, I think. And of course, Jesus got it from his Jewish ancestors for whom compassion was the secret name of God. And Jesus let the secret out of the bay. So um, it's universal. Uh, Muhammad in the Quran, by far the most frequently invoked uh, adjective for Allah in the Quran is Allah, the compassionate one. So all these inspired writings and teachers are calling humanity to compassion and therefore that must mean one we're capable of it but two but, but where is it you know where is it in history etc well we've talked about a few examples and it is there sometimes and, and it's there now look at the polish people are doing welcoming millions of of refugees who arrived properly overnight you know i mean a complete disruption of their daily lives etc so we are capable of compassion and um that's the good news so i i i wrote a major book on this called one river many wells where i go through 17 themes or 18 themes that i think are common to all of humanity and um and i show the wisdom from all these different traditions around each of these themes whether it's the sacredness of creation or um the role of meditation or the role of uh, life after death, how we talk about that, and um, but of joy and of justice and of spiritual warriorhood. Uh, so I think it's a special time to be living where we can call on one another's wisdom and not just be stuck in our particular silo. Uh, I think that's really important, so much bigger than our imaginations. I mean, let's give the spirit a chance here. <laughs> I have heard religious traditionalists express many of the same sentiments that, that you've just echoed, uh, but I seem to recall in uh, one passage from your new book that you're concerned about the potential alignment of religious traditionalism with fascism. Yeah, it's not just potential, it's what happened in, in, uh, in the Second World War, that um, uh, Fascism became a new religion and um, took in a lot of religious believers, if you will, and religious structures. And, um, you know, the facts are that organized religion in Germany, for example, both Protestant and Catholic, did not as a as a group stand up against Nazism. There were individuals like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a real saint. Uh, Lutheran pastor, but uh, they actually um, killed him for doing so, and they killed a lot of others, and they put people in concentration camps and so forth who stood up to, to Hitler. And of course, uh, Franco in Spain and um, Mussolini in Italy. Uh, and Hitler himself was a Catholic, and he was never excommunicated. So I sometimes ask, you know, <laughs> what does it take to get excommunicated around here? Uh, well, getting an abortion gets to excommunicate, apparently, or or cl calling for women being ordained a priest gets excommunicated, but killing six million Jews and uh, starting a war that kills 42 million people, he never got excommunicated. It kind of makes you wonder. So, you know, that's why conscience is so important and, and integrity. And one has to keep one's own conscience and... Um, no one institution is, um, what can I say, is is always right. <laughs> um, there's a difference between the, the kingdom of God that Jesus promised and the kingdom of God and church. 
They aren't the same thing. No theologian worthy of the name would, would confuse the two. But in practice, it can be confused and confusing. And um, so we always have to be alert for fascism. And fascism is a way of seeing the world uh, in which, um, well, uh, Susan Sontag defined it as institutional violence, institutional violence. So it's kind of the blessing of violence in the institution's name. And that institution can be religious or it can be a nation state, uh, it can be um, a political party and so forth. So every person has to keep their conscience alive and wet and um, alert. And that's part of spiritual warriorhood is, you know, the, the warrior has to be alert and awake and not uh, sleeping on the job and um, turning over one's responsibility to others entirely. Um, and I think that that's what fascism likes is to make all the the um the decisions and and of course Mussolini used to say only I can fix it and that attitude is found in all authoritarianism whether it's from Brazil the president of Brazil today or the president of Hungary or Putin of course or certain individuals in our country in America today are saying exactly those words straight from Mussolini's mouth only I can fix it that's a very scary and dangerous uh proposition and uh, again, it's, it, it amounts to idolatry. Uh, it's turning an individual and his or her party or ideology into a god. And that's where cults begin and end. And uh, we're, you know, we're, we're dangerously on paths like this around the world today. Because, because things are messy. <laughs> and in a way, you kind of envy a China or Russia, where there's one guy making all the decisions. Granted, they're surrounded perhaps by others. I think the Chinese do a better job of that than the Russians do. But um, uh, you can make quicker decisions. If, if a, a nation like China makes a decision to close all its coal plants, which it hasn't done yet, but to really try to move their huge uh, population into the direction of more green living and therefore saving the future, um, you know, it's more efficient. And there's something, you know, kind of um, inviting about that. <laughs> but you have to back up and ask, ah, but at what price? Because the same government can make a decision that one group of Muslims uh, need to be locked up and and so forth. So the minorities in those circumstances, um, you know, are 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 bad can be very badly treated because they have no rights so we have to kind of gather all this wisdom of our of our species over the centuries and to learn from our previous mistakes and um uh and try to forge something that's um well that's sustainable I wish, for example, that all the nations would decide that the number one enemy, if you will, of all of our people is climate change. So let's stop all the wars and let's turn our defense departments into defending Mother Earth, who is, who, if she is defended well, will keep providing a healthy, a healthy life and a beautiful life for all of us and all the other beings. Why don't we decide on that? That we've outgrown war. War is an adolescent exercise. Um, and um, we now have to be adults because we're facing our extinction. And I think a perfect, you know, we had this icon for decades, a wonderful one. And that was a picture of the Earth taken by the astronauts uh, who left the Earth. Great icon. But now we have one of Jupiter One, you know, who left our solar system, the first creation of human beings that has left our solar system and looked back and saw its journey. And what you see are dots of light. And then the scientists point an arrow in this one dot of light, that's Earth. I think that should be the icon of our time because it puts it in perspective. Earth is so special. Where else in the whole universe of two trillion galaxies are there giraffes and polar bears 
and elephants and whales and rainforests, nowhere else. So why don't we all celebrate that? And if your ideology is, is your favorite thing, bring that to the table. How does your ideology help us to, to make Earth survive? And how does mine? Let's pool our resources and let's pool our defense departments and all this money and science and technology that we put into creating weapons to kill ourselves with. Why don't we put that into weapons to defend ourselves with? Against who? Against ourselves. We're the problem. So we've got to work on that reptilian brain. We've got to work on that. And there are ways, you know, meditation calms the reptilian brain. Sports can calm the reptilian brain. Because in sports, we play with the reptilian brain. You know, we have these parameters are called the basketball court. We've got umpires, we've got a clock, and we've got rules. So the umpires enforce the rules. But with all that going, and then then we say two teams go out and do your reptilian things. One win, one lose. That's what reptilian brain is about. I win, you lose. And then everyone cheers and screams and all that good stuff. And then it's over. And no one's dead. <laughs> and the and the planet is not destroyed. And um, and you feel bad for a few days if, if your team lost. And you feel elated if you won, but it's all over in a few days anyway. It's playing with the reptilian brain. I just think it's genius in the part of humans to invented sports. And I don't know any tribe that hasn't invented sports. And only, you know, you can you can misuse them, of course. But in that in the real context of needing to calm the reptilian brain, meditation is one way, but I think sports are another. And there are other ways too, creativity, art. Art is a great way to deal with violence and and uh, anger, moral outrage, and it doesn't have to hurt anybody either. So um, these are ways to go, and these are the kind of things we should be debating and discussing today, not whether Putin has a new supersonic uh, way to kill us faster and uh, more efficiently. I mean, how crazy can a species be to be destroying one another and the earth are <laughs> nest at the same time. It's just folly. You know, Thomas Aquinas said 700 years ago, one human being can do more evil than all the other species put together. And this is 700 years before Stalin, Hitler, Pol Pot, or Putin. You know, how did he know that? Because he respected our intelligence and our creativity. He knew how wild it was, how wild it was. And it can be divinely beautiful, and it can be demonically destructive. And that's where choice comes in, and and, wait, and growing up comes in. We have to get out of this adolescent stage of it's all about me, it's all about me. It isn't. It's about us. And us means the whole universe and the whole earth and all the creatures, yes, and all of our species. That's the step we have to take from I to we. What a wonderful message, Matthew. I'm so delighted to be able to share this with our viewers. It's a real pleasure to be with you again after so many decades. And I'm also very happy to let our viewers know that we're talking about doing something of a, a career retrospective series of discussions with you, because I know there's so much more to say about Aquinas and about Hildegard and about Julian of Norwich and to share your passion for the great mystics of history. Thank you for your thoughtful questions. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. It's, it's been a great pleasure. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.